Christopher Parsons, who is an associate professor in the Departments of Medicine and Microbiology at, here at LSU Health Sciences Center. And Dr. Parsons is a physician here at the HIV Outpatient Clinic. He also serves as the director of the HIV Malignancies Program. His topic today is epidemiology of malignancies in patients with HIV. Before we actually begin, I need to make you mindful, make you aware that to please mute your microphones and minimize any background noise. Also, the AAFP CEs have been approved. We are awaiting approval from the SCAP uh, CE unit, which is formerly LSNA. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Dr. Parsons? Hello, everyone. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I'll talk slowly and project, and um, I'd be happy to take any questions after the talk or if it's possible during the talk, that's fine too. I want this to be very informal, and uh, I'll give you a broad overview of some of the things we're dealing with in New Orleans and in Louisiana in terms of cancer in our HIV population and provide some national data where, uh, which will reiterate the importance of some of these concepts. So the, the first thing I was going to tell you is that, although this is not a product uh, talk by any stretch, years ago Gilead had asked me to create a slide deck which was not product for HIV and malignancies, given my expertise. So I did that for them. So some of the slides today were pulled from the slide deck that I, that I had made and updated. So today I'll give you an overview uh, regarding some mechanisms uh, related to the development of cancer and HIV, some of the epidemiology for both AIDS-defining malignancies and non-AIDS-defining malignancies, which are somewhat outdated concepts at this point, but I'll explain that. We'll discuss the cancer-related mortality uh, for patients with HIV and some guidelines uh, for cancer screening and prevention with HIV. And again, feel free to ask questions if that's possible. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to. Sorry, layout switch. Okay. Sorry, everyone. I'm not going to dwell on this slide too long, uh, but it kind of illustrates some general concepts about uh, cancer and HIV. And, of course, the majority of cancers we see in the setting of HIV are related to opportunistic viral infections with hepatitis viruses, HPV, and then the oncogenic herpes viruses, EBV and KSHV, otherwise known as HHV8, being the principal drivers of, of what we see. And a combination of gen uh, genomic instability, which is associated with HIV infection itself and oxidative stress, immune surveillance issues, uh, due to, uh, once again, um, immunologic impact of, of HIV, and then cytokine pathways and other potentially other modi modifiable factors like alcohol consumption and cigarette smoke all kind of conspire to work against our HIV patients uh, in terms of cancer risk. So a couple of comments about epidemiology. And the studies that are cited here are among the largest and most recently published studies uh, both from Europe and North America. And the data from these studies essentially indicates that cancer is one of, if not the most common cause of non-AIDS-related deaths now in our, in our patients with other infections and cardiovascular disease uh, being, being right up there. Of course, liver disease and, and renal and respiratory issues uh, are, are part of this pie, but the overall message here is that cancer and basically heart disease are the two most common causes of death now in the modern era for HIV. So I mentioned to you these terms, AIDS-defining malignancies and non-AIDS-defining malignancies. These are used to categorize cancers, essentially, uh, into those that we were tradition traditionally associated with low CD4 counts and those that we, we don't necessarily associate with low CD4 counts. And in, in the latter group, those are cancers that you also see commonly in the general population. Those terms are a little bit misleading now because we see a lot of the so-called AIDS-defining cancers in patients who have better CD4 counts and who are actually doing very well with their HIV uh, therapy and have undetectable loads in many cases. 
But for the purposes of this talk and for these categories, the AIDS-defining AIDS malignancies refer mainly to KS, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and invasive cervical cancer, whereas the non-AIDS-defining group contains a, a, a slew of cancers, including anal cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, hepatocellular carcinoma, or liver cancer, and then a smattering of others. Well, I'll show you uh, some data in a little while, but there are a few cancers where despite improvements in HIV therapy, the actual incidence is actually increasing, and those include anal rectal cancer, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and hepatocellular carcinoma, as well as lung cancer. So some of the cancers we see are not just because of the aging population. Some of them seem to be increasing in incidence um, beyond what we would expect just with, with uh, better survival of our HIV patients. So this graph essentially depicts what's happened with the AIDS-defining malignancies in terms of incidence uh, dating back to the early 90s. <clears throat> and two, two main trends you'll see in the mid-90s, the incidence for uh, AIDS-defining malignancies dropped off with the advent of protease inhibitors and better HIV therapy, but it, is not, uh, it has not dropped off the map. So it's been very stable through the late 90s and 2000s and data from the uh, National Institute of Health and the NCI now would suggest that uh, for KS and anal rectal cancer or cervical cancer and lymphoma, the incidence and prevalence of those diseases has not changed much uh, since the mid-2000s. So if you're in, you practice in an area where there are a lot of HIV patients, you will continue to see these cancers. In contrast, for the non-AIDS defining malignancies, we're seeing more of those cases in, in part because the incidence has remained the same but the population is aging. So uh, you'll see there that over the pretty steadily since the early 90s, we see more of these, these types of cancers, and once again, including lung cancer, anal rectal cancer, um, and, and liver cancer being, being among the, uh, the top cancers there. So what I mentioned to you before uh, is that there are some cancers where the incidence is actually increasing, and this, this dotted line here is not flat. Once again, that's for anal rectal cancer, uh, hepatocellular cancer, lung cancer, and Hodgkin's lymphoma. But for all cancers taken all together, including a number of other cancers that are increased uh, in terms of incidence in HIV, the incidence has remained flat, but the population ages, and so we see more of those, those cancers. So these are some incidence uh, numbers from some of the more common non-AIDS-defining malignancies. And you'll see that the relative risk is very high for anorectal cancer and vaginal cancer. I want to make note that most of the cancers on this chart are actually caused by viruses. So anorectal cancer caused by HPV. Vaginal cancer in the setting of uh, HIV infection, largely also associated with HPV, interestingly. Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, more often associated with EBV. And then liver cancer, of course, associated with hepatitis viruses, mainly hepatitis C. There are a number of other cancers for which there are no infectious etiologies that we know of, but they're common in the general population. They happen to be more common in the setting of HIV infection. Those include lung cancer, uh, melanoma, uh, oral cancers, some of which are caused by HPV. Interestingly, leukemia uh, is, is a big one. Colorectal cancer is a little bit um, controversial. In this particular large study and a couple of others, the relative risk is about twofold general population. And then finally, uh, renal cell cancer. The renal cell data uh, seem to be fairly uh, stable. So one point that I always make to my audiences is that if you have an HIV patient, even one who's doing well, with unexplained hematuria, then have a fairly low threshold for evalu evaluating that patient in terms of a cystoscopy and, uh, and uh, ultrasound or a CAT scan, because renal cell carcinoma is, is more common in the setting of HIV infection. So a number of other cancers uh, that are listed here, I won't go through the whole, um, whole list, but suffice it to say that the incidence of a number of different types of common cancers are greater in the setting of HIV infection. So you know, we, we tell our uh, trainees and other folks to have a low threshold for evaluating symptoms that are relatively unexplained, especially in patients who are older, particularly over the age of, of 50. One point to make here is that uh, many of these cancers are diagnosed at a much earlier age in the setting of HIV infection than they are in HIV-negative individuals. 
So we list several here, and there are some dramatic examples. You can see non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with a difference of about uh, 24 or so years. You can see lung cancer, which is third from the bottom, where the mean age of diagnosis is somewhere in the mid low mid-50s as compared to uh, 60s in people who do not have HIV. So these data have uh, generated a lot of discussion about screening practices and whether we should uh, step up screening for our patients at an earlier age or do something different than for the general population. And we'll discuss that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. I should note that the uh, bottom two cancers listed here, which obviously are common, breast and prostate cancer, several studies indicate that those two cancers are not more common in the setting of HIV. However, if they do arise, they tend to arise much earlier, and the stage of disease at the time of diagnosis is later relative to HIV-negative individuals. So uh, there's some interesting mechanistic concepts there. Um, I'll mention one of those with regard to breast cancer. It appears as though uh, breast cancer cells themselves express CXCR5, and that HIV infection modulates chemokine expression on breast epithelial cells, and there are some animal model data suggesting this may actually be protective for women in terms of breast cancer instance. But these are all still uh, hypotheses, and it's very early uh, in the research game, so to speak, as to know whether, whether that's legitimate. So I'll, get, I'll uh, now talk a little bit about the effect of antiretroviral therapy on cancers. And by the way, if anyone has any questions as we go along here in these sections, let me know. I try to keep the slide number down so you can feel free to ask questions. There are several large cohorts which consistently link CD4 counts less than 500 to increased risk for, for cancers. And there are several mm -hmm. endpoints that have been looked at for both individual mm -hmm. cancers and cancers as a composite endpoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some, some of those data are listed here. There's mm -hmm. certainly an Burn increased risk of cancer yeah. with lower CD4 counts, less than 200, and that, that is the All case right. for lymphoma, capsi sarcoma, anorectal cancer, cervical right. cancer. But the risk for those cancers remains elevated um, with CD4 counts lower than 500, uh, again, relative to those who were started on therapy at CD4 counts greater than 500. And so uh, part of those uh, data are now uh, cited in the DHHS guidelines and suggest that uh, prevention of cancer may be one of many reasons why we want to start HIV-infected patients on antiretroviral therapy earlier rather than later. And um, there are uh, a number of other studies that were designed to look at morbidity and specific uh, complications of HIV in patients where you either wait on starting therapy or that you start early. And the, uh, some of the larger trials, including the SMART trials, indicated that two things. One is if you wait to start therapy, then there's a greater incidence of cancer over a period of five to ten years. And then secondly, patients who actually have other opportunistic infections or a history of those, and it could be anything from pneumocystis pneumonia um, to other what you think relatively benign infections, thrush, for example, patients who have other opportunistic infections or a history of those are at greater risk for cancer development. There are also individual cancers where if patients have a history of other opportunistic infections, that impacts their prognosis. So for cap sarcoma, for example, if you have a history of other opportunistic infections at the time of diagnosis, then your prognosis is worse than if you haven't. And so there's a lot of interest in determining whether pathogen-pathogen interactions or interactions between bacteria and viruses or fungi and viruses uh, or two different viruses impact uh, cancer risk. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but there's some relatively nice data published in the last few years indicating <clears throat> that patients who have had um, lung infections, and particularly bacterial lung infections, are at greater risk for lung cancer. So once again, the concept there is that inflammation in the local environment caused by other infections may contribute to cancer development. So a lot of that research is, is still in progress. The, uh, there are several risk factors um, which, in addition to 
CD4 count have played out in, in studies. One of those is uh, virologic suppression. So even when controlling for CD4 count, HIV viral loads appear to be an independent risk factor for cancer development. And in particular, uh, there are several studies indicating that if your viral load is continuously over four or 500 copies per ml over, again, a period of a few years, then you're at greater risk for incident cancers. And that's cancers as uh, a composite endpoint. There are, several, uh, there are several studies which have attempted to look at individual cancers in this respect. There are data from UCSF, for example, indicating that detectable viremia is a risk factor for liver cancer in patients who are infected by hepatitis C. And there are other data suggesting that both uh, CAPC sarcoma and lymphoma prognosis is certainly worse with detectable uh, viral loads, and that incident KS uh, may be greater in patients who have detectable viral loads. So once again, cancer is one of many issues that our patients face with undetectable viral loads, and is part of the conversation uh, that may improve uh, your communication with patients and helping them be adherent with their therapies. Age, as I mentioned to you previously, is a big risk factor for cancer. And uh, I'll move on to the next one. We already mentioned some of these, these data here. A lot of the data for antiretroviral therapy and reducing cancer risk come from San Francisco cohorts. This is just one published a few years ago, where once again, the risk for KS and lymphoma, including CNS lymphoma, was reduced in patients who had um, effective antiretroviral therapy. The, uh, I get asked a lot of questions about HPV. Our local expert here is Mike Hagency, and I would defer any uh, questions to him uh, regarding either treatment of HPV disease or screening for HPV disease. But the data suggests that antiretroviral therapy protects against uh, incident HPV infection. And those of you who are lucky enough to practice in an area where your patients are not already HPV infected. Secondly, it appears as though antiretroviral therapy uh, improves clearance of low-grade HPV-associated lesions. And so, once again, if you have uh, women, or even really extrapolating to uh, men uh, with anal uh, dysplasia, we think that antiretroviral therapy improves um, clearance of pre-malignant, early pre-malignant lesions. And it remains to be seen whether uh, cervical cancer itself is directly impacted by better virologic control, but certainly that's uh, uh, an issue of interest. Okay, anyone sitting before me or anyone else have a question? Paul. I have a good question. When you were talking about detectable viral load with increased risk of malignancy, is that uncontrolled viremia or, or were they looking at people with like 500? Yeah, so most of the uh, data now use the lower cutoffs for the viral load assays, either 40 or, or 20 in some cases. And so you can detect viremia at low copy numbers, as opposed to studies that were older where the cutoff was 400. All right. So the data with the uh, more sensitive viral load assays suggests that if your viral load is above 500 over a continuous time frame, which is not a viral load where we can, for example, get genotypes routinely or, or even where your patients are generally sick, but at the, even at that relatively low level of replication, the people are at risk for cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Okay. I'll talk a little bit about uh, screening here, and uh, please feel free to chime in about this. There are guidelines that were put out by IDSA several years ago, and they really haven't changed much since then. <clears throat> and one of our challenges as HIV providers is to um, you know, do our due diligence with our patients as part of primary care. But there are several of us uh, in, in this field who feel like the screening recommendations for HIV patients probably should be different in some ways fundamentally than for HIV uh, uninfected folks. And I'll mention just a couple of examples about that. Obviously, smoking is critically important. <clears throat> it should be stated and, and not, um, not downplayed that the risk of lung cancer is probably greatest for HIV patients who smoke compared to any other demographic. So when you combine those two things, 
the uh, relative risk of lung cancer is about 30-fold what it is uh, compared to HIV uninfected individuals who do not smoke. I hear. Me... Uh, Question? Maybe not. When you factor out smoking, uh, HIV itself, as I mentioned to you previously, appears to be uh, appears to incur about a three to four fold increased risk in lung cancer it, by itself. So we don't think that smoking is the whole story, but certainly um, it accelerates the process. And I'm sure that the combination of HIV infection and perhaps um, lack of adherence and ongoing detection of vir uh, HIV viremia combined with years of smoking will speed up the process and contribute to the fact that our patients diagnosed with lung cancer, the median age of that is around the, in the low 50s as compared to 60s for HIV uninfected folks. So smoking cessation is, is critical. We all do our best with hepatitis vaccines, uh, hepatitis B in particular. Obviously, we don't have a vaccine for hepatitis C, but as the oral therapies for hepatitis C develop <clears throat> and more of our patients are engaged in hepatitis C care as outpatients, uh, it will be interesting to know whether that impacts uh, liver cancer incidence or um, more prognosis. For the time being, uh, in terms of colonoscopies, the screening recommendations are similar to the general population. But remember what I mentioned to you about colon cancer, where if those patients uh, are HIV infected, they are diagnosed, again, in their early 50s, uh, with, generally speaking. So. Colon cancer is a uh, time-dependent process with pre-malignant lesions that may be present years in advance of, of uh, detectable disease. So uh, I would have a low threshold, certainly, for uh, colonoscopies in your patients who have lower GI bleeding, um, certainly which is unexplained. Family histories, of course, play into this. And there are no formal recommendations for doing this earlier than what we already do. But uh, again, it might not be a bad idea. Mammographies are something, obviously, we, we do with our, our uh, HIV-infected women. And um, what the guidelines have recommended is individual risk assessment, which may allow you to uh, perform mammograms or as early as perhaps the age of 40. That's not so different, again, from the HIV-negative uh, guidelines for women. Well, all that we can tell you about that is that breast cancer itself, once again, is not more common in the setting of HIV, but when we see it, it tends to be aggressive and it tends to occur at an earlier age. So I guess what I would reiterate is that women who have uh, any kind of suspicious calcifications, for example, or relatively unexplained nodules that are, that are all questioned to the radiologist, then we want to try to get those women you know, repeat imaging, maybe an MRI, maybe some better modality to make sure um, that, that this is not representative of cancer. Uh, I think you're all familiar with the cervical PAP uh, guidelines. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. I'm glad Mike actually just walked in. I cited him a few minutes ago. Oh, One thing we're trying to uh, certainly push at LSU is anal rectal screening using, using anal PAPs. It's actually very easy. If you have any questions how to do it, uh, Dr. Hagen sees the man. Um, and we've started doing that on a small scale here in, in our clinic. It's very easy to do at bedside. And it remains to be seen yet how these guidelines will evolve. But really targeting uh, high-risk patients, which might include men who have sex with men, people who have a lot, a lot of sexual partners, people who have existing uh, anal rectal lesions, those are all uh, important folks to screen because, once again, uh, this, this effort can prevent uh, aggressive presentations of anorectal cancer that unfortunately we see all too often here at LSU. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about um, the different approaches, if you will, to anal pap screening, but suffice it again, uh, suffice to say that really it should be part of your regular practice in a busy HIV clinic, again with uh, sexually active individuals. It sounds like it might be an onerous task, uh, but once again, the actual performance of the test is fairly straightforward. And then sending it to uh, pathology and cytopathology, et cetera, and, and working through all that um, is something that's kind of a center-specific issue. But if you have more questions about that, Mike is here now. He can tell you everything you want to know. So uh, feel free to ask later. Yeah, no, it is, it is. It's done blindly, so you don't have to have any skill doing a pelvic examination or anything like that. So it's just a very simple technique. Anyone can do it.
So we're encouraging the primary care providers to do the initial screen, and then we'll follow up the end. That's right. Even I can do it. I can do it. You can do it. I talked to Dr. Murphy this morning, and so we're going to have a conversation in the next week or two to set something up in no ways. Great. Great. Good. So this is kind of a summary slide. Um, yeah, I'll stop here for a minute if anyone else has any additional questions about screening or anything else we've discussed. Feel free to chime in. If not, we will move on. Okay. I have this slide up here a couple times. And feel free to take down the information. Uh, call my office or email me or cell phone if you have patients you're concerned about. <clears throat> and this is a segue into discussing our own process here at LSU for trying to get people with cancer into care and potentially into trials if that's, if that's a good idea for them. But feel free to contact me. Uh, the other person to contact is Carrie Watson, who's our navigator. Carrie, I don't, she's in our audience here. Um, I have her phone number, I think, by heart, so I will state it now. It's not on this slide. 504-826-2601, extension 231. A21. Sorry. 2601. Sorry, sorry. 231. Let me repeat that. 504 821 2601 extension 231. And between she and I, we uh, try to get people the assistance they need. Okay. We have opened, along with uh, Mike's help and several other people, a process through which we enroll patients in clinical trials or even actually in, in routine uh, care. And it involves several centers here locally and buy-in from a number, of, uh, a number of institutions, including Auctioner and, and the task force and other folks. So this is uh, not a proprietary uh, operation. We will uh, be willing to work with and for anyone who needs help, basically. And so what we really try to do is provide timely standard of care at one of the, our operating locations. And then secondly, if patients need specific care and would benefit from clinical trials, then we do the screening uh, for that and, uh, and get them enrolled. So we have active clinics for cancer patients at HOP, if you're a HOP patient, at the uh, main ILH campus uh, and St. Charles, if you are not a HOP patient. And then if you need specialized care and clinical trial care, then we set that up through our clinical trials unit at the main hospital, which is a wholly separate location. And we've had a lot of luck with the dean and some other folks in, in doing that. There are a couple of folks uh, at HOP you can also contact in addition to me. Allison Fleury is in the audience, and she's been our trial coordinator for the new CAPC sarcoma study that we opened a couple of months ago. We've enrolled two folks last week, and I have a couple more we're screening. So I'll mention that again here, here in a second. Okay, Carrie's navigated a lot of folks already, and this isn't even an updated list, but she provides all kinds of services and it keeps her running. So that could be coordination of visits, um, helping communication between physicians and patients. Carrie's been sitting with patients in appointments on several occasions, making sure that their emotional support needs are met and, uh, and that they get to the right place. Transportation is a huge issue for our patients in New Orleans. So we have a separate uh, budget for that, a contract through NOAIDS that carry, uh, helps provide transportation for those who need it. And then pharmacy and medication assistance and coordination of hospital visits and housing if needed. I'll show you uh, a slide in a minute with the Hope Lodge. <clears throat> so uh, if you, anyone else outside of New Orleans uh, or outside of LSU has patients that have cancer or they need a, uh, an evaluation to determine that, then you should contact Carrie or myself, and we'll help them get where they need to go. This is a slide of the Hope Lodge in New Orleans. Uh, Carrie and Sam Iraqi is our outreach coordinator, who will be starting back up with our program soon, fortunately for us, and stationed at No AIDS along with Carrie. The Hope Lodge has been really great about uh, providing housing for patients from out of town who may come for chemotherapy or even uh, an extended evaluation. So we can provide housing for, for patients for free through them. We have several trials that are uh, either open or in the works. Um, I point your attention to the one in the middle for the time being, which is the CAPC sarcoma trial, which was just opened in late January. 
And we can enroll anyone with KS at any stage of disease, but we're really trying to target people who have stage three disease, which means lung involvement, intestine involvement, KS in the mouth, low CD4 counts, and again, a history of other problems, other opportunistic infections. That whole constellation of issues, and you don't have to have all of them, but if you have organ involvement, then your survival is much more limited. And it, according to uh, you know, best published data, best trials, the median survival for KS patients in that situation is only a year, year and a half, even with best care. So we're really trying to get to these folks early in a couple of contexts. One is antiretroviral therapy and maintaining them in care and with low CE4 count, uh, low, low viral load, sorry. And then secondly, if they have suspicious lesions, getting them biopsied, getting them diagnosed, getting them staged, and then being aggressive with the chemotherapy if they require it up front. We see a lot of patients here who unfortunately have had the diagnosis for a while. They haven't really gotten sick from it. Maybe they just have skin involvement, clinically at least. Perhaps they haven't been fully staged, or perhaps they have and just not uh, followed up. And they present a little bit sicker, and at that point, uh, we have trouble getting them back. So it's much better to attack these things on the on the front end. Just for some um, center-specific data, Carrie's navigated 16 patients with KS since we started the formal navigation part of our program. And of those 16, 12 of them had stage three disease at the time of diagnosis. And of those 12, five have passed. And a sixth will probably pass, unfortunately, soon. So this is just an illustration that, at least in New Orleans, we still see a lot of patients with fairly aggressive uh, late stage KS who get sick despite best efforts. And the five that passed, at the time they passed, had low if not undetectable viral loads, and in a couple of cases, good CD4 counts. But the disease had already done its job, made its way around several organs, and it's very difficult to get, a get ahead of that when, it's, when that's the case. We have plenty of trials for, uh, well, we have some trials for other things. One, uh, we have, Mike has some trials open for you know, um, folks who have warts or are at risk for anorectal cancers. We have an open trial for patients with solid tumors uh, and people with HIV infection. And we have several uh, other tissue-based trials or prevention studies that pa patients can get involved in, get reimbursed for their time. And uh, we have a lot of patients here who are interested in those because of family histories of cancer or their concern for, the, you know, for their own, for their own uh, well-being down the road. A lot of smokers in our clinic um, and a lot of people who have um, pre-malignant lesions, particularly warts. So we have a lot of HPV disease in our, in our clinic here. So um, if you have any questions about any of these studies, feel free to, to let us know. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but our, you know, our own uh, population of folks who have enrolled in some of these studies uh, is really representative of our general clinic population. But we still have a lot of, um, a lot of women in our population in the studies, almost half. Most of our patients um, you know, represent uh, minority groups, particularly uh, African-American patients, and that would be the same for the HOP clinic. But I should note that um, patients of African heritage are at greater risk for bad outcomes for many cancers, including cervical cancer, uh, KS in a couple of studies, and lymphoma in, in one or two studies. So uh, once again, uh, we're trying to uh, get to folks who we think are at greatest risk so we can screen them and uh, get them care they need if they unfortunately have cancer. Okay, I put my contact information back up here again to pound it into your head. Carrie's number once again, because it's not up here. I'm like a bad commercial. 504-821-2601, extension 231. Any questions? Comments? Prevention. I really don't think people, a lot of people in our cohort uh, do very well once they come with a diagnosis. And that's a broad statement related to lung cancer and those PVC, uh, KS for sure, lymphoma. The survival uh, for lymphoma actually is quite good for HIV patients now compared to what it used to be, <clears throat> but it's still not very good for folks from uh, urban, again, minority predominant populations where, uh, again, they may have been in and out of HIV care 
and had less effective uh, HIV therapy over a period of years. But um, it's much easier to prevent these things than to treat them. So a lot of what's happening at the level of the National Institute of Health is moving in the direction of prevention and funding prevention type studies. And Mike and I both hope that they put their money where their mouth is because that's what we're both interested in. Um, but really getting people in HIV care early as a generic statement and then thinking about cancer uh, when people come in either with symptoms or risk factors and engaging them in that conversation so that they don't think that HIV therapy is going to make them cancer free. In fact, that's not the case. We still see a lot of cancers. We see more now than we ever did. So cancer should be in the forefront of people's general thought process, but prevention is going to be worth the pound of cure, so to speak, as I say, I think. So that's, that's our main goal. Can you comment on uh, an immune, immune reconstitution-like syndrome with malignancy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much like um, infections, a variety of cancers have been reported in the context of immune reconstitution. And so, as you guys mostly all know, that means somebody started on HIV therapy, or maybe they've been out of care for a while and restarted on HIV therapy. <clears throat> and you see a, an increase in their CD4 cells. The dogma there is that it's a relatively rapid rise over a period of a few months, but that's not entirely the story. Um, you may see a steady rise over a period of, say, several months to a year. And cancers can arise in that setting. And so we think that several cancers, their um, pathogenesis or their mechanistic um, activity, if you will, is directly related to excessive inflammation. And so these patients who get HIV therapy and have even transient uh, T-cell activation and lymphadenopathy and activation of other pathways are at least at risk for um, incident cancers. And so I'll give you one example for that. Patients who have um, more effective HIV therapy within the first two years of receiving it, meaning they have a CD4 count that increases beyond a certain cutoff point, have a greater, are at greater risk for developing KS than patients who receive HIV therapy and do not achieve that rapid rise in CD4 cells. So there's some data from a couple of different centers indicating that in a high risk population with a lot of KSHV infected individuals, you're more likely to see KS with more effective antiretroviral therapy in the early time frame. Mm -hmm. When you get past that, the incidence is lower, the risk is lower, and so forth. But what that implies, at least for KS, is that inflammation in the early stages of HIV therapy contributes to the appearance of the disease. But there are several other cancers that have been associated with immune reconstitution. Lymphoma. Uh, lung cancer, a couple of studies, um, certainly or, uh, HPV-related cancers. There are a multitude of studies for oral cancer, um, cervical cancer, I think, Mike, and certainly anal rectal cancer. So um, if you have somebody who you already know is at risk for a virus-associated cancer and you start them on HIV therapy, then what we would say is just be aware of this possibility if somebody gets sick with new adenopathy or new skin lesions, or uh, new anal rectal lesions, whatever, then low threshold for evaluation in those cases. Um, in the case of KS patients, the most tr uh, problematic thing is immune reconstitution with lung involvement. But we don't see that that much in the US. They do see it quite a bit in Africa. Um, most of the KS presentations are dermatologic skin disease. But we have seen several cases here of people who have been on effective antiretroviral therapy and they start um, having GI bleeding or um, get short of breath. And um, the thought there is that just have a low threshold for evaluation of those folks and think about cancer for related to immune reconstitution, much like you would uh, PJP or other infections. And we could certainly consider for like an intake panel and for the appropriate individual with anal path as being part of the, you know, the phase two probably visit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we're digging up some data, hopefully, from this ICON network 
got the data sets because he's trying to sort through them all to find out exactly who those people be. And it seems to be there's two populations. It seems like the 20 to 30 year old has a lot of warts, mm -hmm. but we are seeing some high grade dysplasia. But then there's another group of about 50. Kind of when you're doing your prostate cancer screening, that maybe I all could. Now I'm doing. I do a prostate exam. I do an anal pap. Um, even heterosexual patients. Have <laughs> Dr. Seal. So sorry. When when you were talking about, so you know the role of prednisone and cash just for everyone, because you know a lot of times they come in and it's immune reconstitution and we think could this be PCP starting therapy and we hit them with prednisone and. The um. The uh, issue now with prednisone in larger centers like ours, where we see a lot of uh, stage three disease, lung involvement, GI involvement. There's enough experience on the part of oncologists and ID practitioners in some of these locations that people would strongly recommend that you not use prednisone in that setting uh, because of some disastrous uh, consequences. A lot of this is anecdotal, but there are some published case reports as well. So it's not clear in somebody who has um, earlier stage disease or skin disease only that prednisone is terribly harmful. But there are some lab-based data suggesting that um, prednisone may impact flower replication. And I can tell you that folks, particularly in San Francisco, are uh, strongly urging folks not to use prednisone or KS patients uh, in the context of immune reconstitution or, any, or anything else because of some uh, anecdotal cases of very rapid progression and, and death with prednisone. So that's my party line. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of it. In terms of the prevention side, is there, has been, and this is kind of what Marco Ruiz was focusing on, any new guidelines in terms of colonoscopy, screening for lung cancer? Yeah, the, nothing of substance. Nothing new. Okay. Yeah, uh, we did talk about that. The, to reiterate, we think that for in several cases, there would be good reason to get some screening tests done earlier than what would be recommended. Um, and we talked about several examples of that. Colon cancer, for example, um, mammograms in some cases, and because of the age at which those folks are diagnosed, if they have HIV, much younger than those who do not have HIV in the early 50s. So probably on the horizon soon for some things, but <laughs> slow in coming. Any other questions? Well, feel free to contact me or Carrie um, with any questions, but typically if you have patients uh, who need uh, assistance with uh, chemotherapy or oncology issues, we have some very good oncologists here. Oh, Tiffany's pointing to something. I have more slides, but I was holding them for questions. Um, what do you think? Begin. Okay. Oh, in the interest of time, maybe I'll, uh, I'll I'll let it go. I provided a lot more slides there for you, including some work from our lab. But uh, if you, nobody has any questions, I think I'll cut it off there. Dr. Parsons for joining us this afternoon for the excellent presentation. As always, we've learned a lot. Again, thank you. He's put up his contact information, so if anyone has any further questions, as he stated, feel free to give him a call. Um, again, we'll see you all next week. Be sure, as always, to complete your paperwork, and if you have any questions for me, feel free to contact me. Thank you again. Have a good afternoon, and we'll see you next month. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.